Articles from G3 Ministries On Baby Grands and Expensive Hymnals Written by David DeBrain and read by Laramie Minga Why this waste? said the greediest member of the Twelve. Judas's supposed concern with helping the poor and for efficient use of ministry finances was really a facade for his unvarnished envy. Judas wanted money, and like every jealous soul, disliked money being spent lavishly on someone else. The sentiment that it is frivolous waste to spend money on anything except dire need is popular among some Christians. It's an easy sentiment to have, even a lazy one perhaps. What could be a better use of money than giving it to those who have the least, right? And what could be a more wasteful use of money than spending more on those who already have enough, correct? Such automatic entitlement functions rather like the left's politics of victimization. Find a race, gender, or sexual orientation that has been supposedly oppressed, and such a group automatically receives the unassailable position of victim, requiring special treatment and requiring no defense of its now-privileged status. The same leftist sentimentalism often brews within Christianity and bubbles out when spending is on anything except extreme need. My church is not wealthy, relative to some others in the city. Our monthly budget is exactly half of some of our sister churches not far from us. Of course, that same budget is several times larger than some of the other churches we know and fellowship with. That's simply life, and as anyone who understands biblical economics knows, inequality is not injustice. But given our middle-sized budget, what justification is there for spending a considerable amount of the hard-earned and saved money of our church on a very expensive musical instrument and on hardcover hymnals? How could we do this amidst a sea of poverty? Why this waste, one might opine? Why not a few guitars and a simple PowerPoint projection? One of the best answers comes from C.S. Lewis in his essay, Learning in Wartime. Lewis faced a similar criticism during World War II. What was the point of having scholars study medieval literature or Anglo-Saxon linguistics when there were Nazis bombing European cities? Wasn't this an almost literal enactment of fiddling while Rome burned? Lewis first countered that the need, be it wartime efforts or a crying social need, has never been enough for humans to suspend humane learning. Plausible reasons have never been lacking for putting off all merely cultural activities until some imminent danger has been averted or some crying injustice put right. But humanity long ago chose to neglect those plausible reasons. They wanted knowledge and beauty now, and would not wait for the suitable moment that never came. They propound mathematical theorems in beleaguered cities, conduct metaphysical arguments in condemned cells, make jokes on scaffolds, discuss the last new poem while advancing to the walls of Quebec, and comb their hair at Thermopylae. This is not panache. It is our nature. But what of the gospel, missions, and church planting? Lewis realized that the sentiment that what is ultimate must capture all our thinking and acting is superficially compelling. How can you be so frivolous and selfish as to think about anything but the salvation of human souls? Lewis answered in two ways. First, he pointed out that conversion does not make one a monomaniac, possessed of only one goal and activity. Before I became a Christian, I do not think I fully realized that one's life, after conversion, would inevitably consist in doing most of the same things one had been doing before. One hopes, in a new spirit, but still the same things. Second, he recognized that were Christians to supposedly give up these frivolous activities, the vacuum would only draw in inferior substitutes. We cannot escape our nature. 
if you attempted in either case to suspend your whole intellectual and aesthetic activity, you would only succeed in substituting a worse cultural life for a better. You are not, in fact, going to read nothing, either in the church or in the line, if you don't read good books, you will read bad ones. If you don't go on thinking rationally, you will think irrationally. If you reject aesthetic satisfactions, you will fall into sensual satisfactions. Christians must continue to pursue the highest and best, even in the presence of dire need. No period of undisturbed tranquility is just over the horizon, the arrival of which will then permit a golden age of pursuing the best that has been thought or written. The time for beauty, higher learning, and the pursuit of excellence is now, whether we are in Monaco or Monrovia. If we, in the name of wartime, lifestyle, gospel-centered, radical, whatever you call it, askew beautiful instruments in quality hymnals, all that will happen is we will sing inferior songs on inferior instruments. Certainly, there is the danger of contented complacency, enjoying Laodicean luxury. Certainly, there will be vast disparities between what one church can do as opposed to another. But it is a fallacy to equate the pursuit of beauty with elitism or self-pampering. If a church gives a serious chunk of its monthly budget to missions, church planting, and to needs within its church, while spending considerably to sing with excellence, it is simply doing what Christians should do, whatever their circumstance. Love God as best you can, and love your neighbor as best you can. You can read this article at g3men.org.